Chapter 19 Enlightened Illusion Borders on Union Square was one of the largest bookstores on the side of the Strand in Manhattan. It was a delightful atmosphere for bibliophiles to wander in through four stories of mental stimulation, whether they were San Franciscans or tourists from around the world. Having solved the riddle of how to square himself by finding like-minded souls, Brad's view of reality expanded, causing him to ask himself, what is reality anyway? Scanning the racks, he mulled over the question that had plagued philosophers for millennia, ending up in the metaphysical and spiritual sections that took up a large part of the third floor. In the New Age and Spirituality section, a magazine cover demanded his attention. What is enlightenment? I don't have any idea, he thought. The promise of universal knowledge made in Natalie's book on the tarot came to mind. He flipped through the magazine, which featured essays by spiritual teachers about finding freedom from suffering and seeking the ultimate truth through guided inquiry. In the bottom corner of one page, the smiling face of the magazine's editor-in-chief, Alex Fleming, appeared next to the words, Journey to India for Enlightenment. It was an advertisement for a two-week stay in an ashram, where the Beatles had stayed with the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, the man behind Transcendental Meditation in 1967. Reading the ad, Brad drew a deep breath and felt an electrical awareness. He had to go. The sudden urge to go to India and learn more about enlightenment was overwhelming and gave him a new mission. The trip was only six weeks away, but the desire burned hot and made him push through the obstacles, including the threat of losing his job at the clinic. Its compulsive medical director balked when Brad cornered him in his office and made the request. With nothing to lose, he tossed the word enlightenment out and witnessed a strange turnabout in his boss's attitude. He authorized it at once. There was power in that word. Soon enough, Brad had a passport, an India visa, and a ticket to New Delhi. He was about to go to the other side of the earth and meet someone who would catalyze him to undergo the biggest inner transformation of his life but it would not be Alex Fleming. An Indian driver speaking perfect English dropped Brad off at San Francisco International Airport. 40 hours later, another Indian driver, this one speaking less than perfect English, deposited him near the ashram in northern India. The combination of connecting United Airlines flights halfway around the world, the all-night drive from Indira Gandhi International Airport, and the 12-hour time change drained him. The driver kept him awake with stories about the holy area, including warnings about monkeys hanging overhead in trees, embodiments of the god Hanuman. They plundered food from the hungry, and it was forbidden to harm them or stop them when caught in the act of pilfering. The taxi passed the ashram where the Beatles had had their magical mystery tour 30 years earlier. That had opened up the holy area, Rishikesh, to Westerners, who had been coming for enlightenment ever since. At Brad's destination, 200 Westerners, followers of American guru Alex Fleming, gathered for his enlightenment retreat. Brad was shown to a small room he would share with another attendee, which was bare except for twin beds and a coffee table. The first meal was being prepared, and the aromas of curry and chai wafted about in the cool November air. The retreat schedule was kept exactly on time, like a military operation. After the meal, everyone gathered at 7 p.m. for the first meditation, during which Alex sat upright in a lotus posture, eyes shut and unmoving for 90 minutes. Brad surveyed the room through half-open eyes. People were nodding or fidgeting, and it was a mighty task to fight off jet lag and stay awake. A few of Alex's closest students, also perfect meditators, sat near him. Finally, Alex opened his eyes and started talking, sharing his own story, then covering rules of conduct. After that, the group broke, and Brad found his bed. At 7 a.m., a 30-minute breakfast was followed by another 90-minute meditation. Alex then opened the talk by inviting questions, and Brad's hand shot up. He was chosen. What happens when a master meditates? It was an innocent enough question. He had to know why someone who had achieved enlightenment after years of seeking it through arduous practice would continue to sit for an hour and a half twice a day. What was going on in that mind? Alex looked down, rubbing his mustache. He scrutinized Brad for a moment before turning his head to one side. I will answer that later. Immediately, he took another question. The session rambled on while Brad's mind spun, trying to come to terms with the evasion of such a basic question. There was a break, 
then lunch, then another satsang, then dinner. Satsang, a gathering for seekers of truth, Brad learned, was a special event. It wasn't a group of people sitting around in a cafe or a teacher conducting a class. It was a formal meeting held by one who had been recognized as enlightened, for those who were seeking it. By nightfall, Brad had come up with three answers to his question and was feeling annoyed with Alex. He spoke with his roommate. Colin, are you getting much of this? The mediations are really helping me to get focused. I can never do it by myself. I love it here. The food, the people, everything. India's amazing. What about his teaching? Why couldn't he tell me what happens when a master meditates? I think I figured it out on my own, and it's only my first day. He's a great teacher. Just because he didn't answer your silly question, that doesn't matter. I love what I'm learning here. Maybe you aren't paying enough attention. So why do you think a master meditates? I ask because I want to know what goes on in the mind of someone who has um, what he calls the perfect realization of absolute truth. And it came to me today. Everything is happening or nothing is happening. Or we could say that there's just pure experience going on. Brad struggled to find words for the profound subject of spiritual enlightenment, and it made his brain tingle, which wasn't necessarily an unpleasant situation. That's cool. Why, why don't you share that at the next gathering, Colin suggested. Having been on the spiritual path for many years, he was just being polite. He took such a discussion from the beginner with no more than a grain of salt and excused himself to go for a hot cup of chai. The thought of sharing his insights with the group conjured the fear of the strict teacher rejecting his ideas and fellow attendees laughing or mocking him. So he found an organizer, one of Alex's close students, and asked if he could speak with the guru one-on-one. -on -one. But they informed him that wasn't allowed. And yet, the insights were burning like a fever in his brain. So he ramped up his courage and prepared to speak to the group. On the second day, people were more settled during their long meditation and at the same time more alert. There was a pleasant buzz, a different kind of energy. Alex began talking about spiritual teachers and practices. He kept talking for an hour and didn't take questions. Then he got up and walked out as though he could sense Brad's intense need for resolution. The newbie spiritual seeker chased down Colin during the break. Hey, man, did you see that? He was avoiding a discussion. Somebody said he's psychic. What do you think? Then a solution came to mind. I got to find another teacher. Do you know any other good ones? <laughs> You're nuts, Colin said. Just hang in there. You'll get another chance. We have 10 more days. He was enjoying the retreat completely, as was everybody else. Hey, there's John, the guy that's been going up and down the river to other ashrams. You should talk to him. Colin pointed at a tall bearded man with glasses. John adjusted his glasses and pinched his beard. Oh yeah, there's some real good gurus all up and down the Ganja. I'm going to a different one every day, but nobody can make me meditate like Alex Fleming does. That's why I'm here. I need to see a spiritual teacher I can talk to, said Brad. I have a hundred questions, and Alex couldn't give me an answer to the first one. Oh, John replied. If you want someone who will answer questions, go see Jayasweta. She might not give the answer you want to hear, though, John laughed, a pained expression coming over his face as though he learned the hard way. If you hurry, you might make her three o'clock satsang. Brad got directions and took off on the same path that Gautama Buddha had walked more than two millennia ago. He reached the Lakshman Jula Bridge in the north part of Rishikesh, an area known for its historic multicolored ashrams. Some of the precarious towers pointed a dozen stories high, and nobody seeing them for the first time would fail to be deeply inspired. Finding the Shashadam Ashram, he looked for a place to sit among a group of about a hundred people who were stirring in the warm sand. Almost all of them were foreigners from Europe, Australia, Asia, and Russia. They were seated around the master who was sitting on a padded stone wall by a big Bodhi tree. Where are you from? Jayasweta asked the newcomer. Stepping over to sit in an opening in the sand, Brad felt the strength of her gaze. He was stunned, shining into his eyes with the sheer force of pure spirit. He knew in that instant, beyond anything a mind could conceive, that she was an enlightened being, a Mahasattva, he would learn. And this was his darshan. California, he said breathless. Waves of energy moved through him, and it suddenly felt like he was halfway out of his body. She smiled and kept her gaze trained on him. Her waist-length blonde hair and smooth, fair skin were totally out of place in India. But that was irrelevant, given her ability to connect him with the entire universe. I'm Brad. Nice to meet you, Jayasweta, he managed to get out. Jayasweta 
went about greeting others, many of whom she knew by name. Then she started singing in Hindi, her eyes closed, her voice setting a beautiful vibration that mesmerized all. People sat with their palms together, some singing along. When it was over, she gave a short talk about her guru, who also lived in the ashram and was ancient. He had inspired her to stay in India, awaken to the truth of what she called the absolute reality, and be of service to the spiritual needs of humanity. When she took questions, Brad was so filled with energy that he was unable to speak. He was transfixed, enjoying the feeling of lightness and presence in the moment. She then concluded her afternoon satsang. On his return to Alex's ashram, Brad found John at the evening meal and enthused, I'm going to see her every day. Thank you. Wow, she got to you. I can see it in your eyes. How was she with your questions? I was so blown away, I couldn't talk. I felt on my way back here like I was floating. The next day he went again and Jaya Suita asked for volunteers to help with chores around Sasha Dam. Brad raised his hand and was assigned to morning cleanup along with others, which started with toilet duty at 6.30 a.m. He didn't hesitate to take on the dirty work in exchange for spiritual attention for Jaya Suita, but it did create a conflict with the rigid schedule at Alex's retreat, a conflict that could only be resolved by checking out of Alex's ashram early and finding a room closer to Sasha Dam. Brad did so in a heartbeat. Colin was shocked, but happy to have the room to himself. Brad helped with cleanup every day, attended satsang often twice, and asking questions. What is the meaning of life? How do I give up my desires? What is the purpose for suffering? How do I discover my purpose? They swirled in his mind after reading the abstract teachings and books by the masters. They arose during contemplations on long walks along the serene Ganges. They were never ending. To give time to others, Jaya Suita had to silence him a couple of times. When not in satsang or doing cleanup, Brad meditated or hung out with the advanced students who would congregate at the German bakery on the west bank of the river at the foot of the bridge. They would drink chai or coffee and, and talk about readings from Nizargadatta, Ramana Maharishi, or advanced Buddhist scriptures like the Lakavatara Sutra that Jaya Suita had instructed everyone to study. Some of the students furtively smoked or nipped from small bottles of liquor, both of which were loudly forbidden by Jaya Suita, who was as pure as a saint. Within a week, Brad's spirit was on fire, such that it melted his thoughts, bringing a mind-emptying experience that lasted for days. A huge mental weight had lifted, leaving nothing but the direct experience of his five senses and a curiosity about what was going to happen next. He went around with nothing to do but to be free in the present moment. The lifting of his constant weighty thoughts was a surprising relief, but it wasn't enlightenment, not even close. He had only gotten his feet wet. Less than a year later, Brad made a second trip to India. The taxi dropped him off at 5 a.m. by some cheap hotels near Lakshman Jula, just minutes by foot from Jayasuita's ashram. After an eight-hour ride from New Delhi, as if to test his desire for attaining enlightenment, he sat shivering on a bench until the sun rose and hotels began to open for business, creating a mystical setting in the foothills of the Himalayas. Smoke drifted in the morning glow from fires up and down the hillsides above the valley. It would be hours before the sun shone directly on the Ganges, right around time for the first satsang of the day. She sat there, the beautiful Jaya Suita, who had pierced his heart instantly and went into a rage. Some of you have been coming here for years, five years, ten years, and you don't awaken. What is your problem? I'm tired of seeing your faces and knowing you're not getting it. Get out. Get out of my ashram if you're not here to awaken to the truth. Her burning eyes pulverized passive minds and timid souls, forcing some to rise, heads bowed in shame, hurting and with tears in their eyes. Those students left never to return. Brad, too, had tears in his eyes, but he had no intention of leaving. The tears came because her severe truth deepened his love for his guru. He was right where he was supposed to be. And the tough message catalyzed his desire for enlightenment more than ever. Prem was a full-time devotee of Jaya Suita's. He had been a lawyer in Denver named Jonathan Murphy before he decided to abandon his Western life and become a Swami living in India. He would gather the men around and hold informal spiritual discussions, 
and one day asked for a group of guys who wanted to chant sutras while they dipped in the ganja. Out of about 25, three hands went up, one of them Brad's. He would have laid on a bed of nails if someone said it would help his spiritual growth. Okay, you guys meet me right down here at 7 a.m., he said, pointing at a sandy spot on the river's edge. With his thick, dark beard and tanned skin, he was often mistaken for a real Indian sage. They showed up, and Prem waded right into a cove where the water was still. This is something the yogis have been doing for thousands of years, except they do it at four in the morning. It's good for your spirit. Just breathe and find the inner stillness. It was January, and they were just miles from the foothills of the Himalayas, the source of the great Ganges. The water was just above 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Brad followed him out, the shock hitting him, making him gasp until they were both standing chest deep. One of the guys had turned back as soon as he felt the water with his toes. The third was struggling to wade in slowly. Namaste, Prem. It it, it looks like it's just you, you and me. Brad put his hands in a prayer position in front of his chest. His voice was shaking from the cold. Namaste, returned Prem. He was relaxed and in his element. Brad relaxed too and let the spirit of the sacred river protect him. He found silent mind for some moments, then waded back onto shore to wait for Prem. Satsangs came and went, and Jayasweeta tackled his questions, sometimes encouraging him, others rejecting him with harsh judgments. It only made him go deeper until he accepted a need to lose the boundaries that defined his human existence and abandon himself to the unknown. His longing to deepen on the path to awakening was obliterated. The truth was discovered to be here and now, and without beginning or end. There was no path and no process. It just was. After his return to California, he went back to work at the pain clinic and lived alone, doing his daily routine of reading, exercising, and meditating. Suddenly, one morning, he awoke and rose without a thought and began to wordlessly pace his monastic apartment with no concept of individual identity. His body was filled with energetic vibration, and within his head, he heard the sound of the creation of the universe. Om. It was a pleasant background sensation that enhanced his focus. The realization came that the creation of the universe was not only something that occurred, according to cosmologists, 13 billion years ago, but it was also occurring right now, all around him from infinite points in space, creating and recreating everything he experienced. He recognized it as the truth he had been seeking, but he didn't know what to do with it. Brad lost his realization of the absolute truth a year later. He tried to blame Jayasweta, who was off teaching in Europe, where she was popular. He tried to blame another guru he was seeing in California, Maya Ji. He had shared his discovery in dialogues with both gurus, and they had said the same thing. That's it. Now be quiet. Don't talk about it. He took that as a sign that he was finished and that by observing a period of silence, he would be spiritually free and entitled to the recognition of having achieved enlightenment. But the masters knew better. Meanwhile, he would go around babbling with his spiritual awareness, excited by new ways of putting words together that would come in bursts of energy until people's eyes glazed over. Months went by, then pangs of desire returned, as relentless as the tide of an ocean. The desires fueled his need for success, and he began to work more, even as the feeling of inner freedom faded. Why, he didn't know. He worried about it and went to a satsang by Adya Shanti, a clever and articulate young teacher who was just starting to hold gatherings and would talk about traps to enlightenment. Even the new knowledge about the traps didn't allow Brad to go deeper. He sat and meditated, but nothing happened. His mind settled into stillness for as long as he cared to sit, and the clock would tick on, taunting his timeless awareness. Thoughts about having better things in life and finding a loving relationship arose from the recess of consciousness, spinning in his mind like a revolving door, making him crave more. He became restless. Perhaps keeping quiet had been bad advice. Brad felt annoyed at the masters and at Jayasweta and Mayaji, who had instructed him to keep quiet. He even accused the bodhisattvas from higher realms. It couldn't be his fault. He had traveled to the other side of the world, endured harsh conditions, and offered up his heart and soul. 
yet his new energy and vibrational purity were being overtaken by old, ego-driven desires. The want for more money. The fantasy of a sexy soulmate. The lust for the high life. The door he had opened to the ultimate reality slammed shut. Brad's mind, having achieved a precious realization of the infinite moment, wandered, floundered, and returned to the ocean of illusion.